Okay, well, welcome to this webinar, Help Me Help You Help Us. I'm David Lee. So this is actually a part of a conference presentation I did last spring titled Why Your Employee Engagement Survey Doesn't Cut It. It's time to customize the employee experience. And so after talking about why employee engagement surveys aren't enough, we went into what to do about it. And that's what this program or this webinar is about. So just in case you don't uh, catch the reference, this is a, a play off that incredibly awkward scene from the movie Jerry Maguire where he's imploring his one and only athlete client, help me help you, help me help you. And it's, uh, not, it's actually not a demeaning uh, conversation like in the movie. It's truly a critical conversation that every manager should have and every employer should have their managers engage in because there's two big reasons for this. One is, despite literally billions of dollars having been spent on improving employee engagement, and actually in America alone, it's a $1.5 billion a year industry, Despite billions of dollars spent, the employee engagement is still, has, the needle has not budged in over 15 years. Still 70% of American workers are not engaged or actively disengaged. So that's one of the reasons why we need to have these conversations because we need to figure out what's going on for, for um, employees to not be uh, engaged. But also more importantly, or I should say just as importantly, is this fact here that that good old Marcus Buckingham, who was involved in the um, original Gallup research on employee engagement, said this years ago, and it's just such a such a wonderfully accurate and wise observation. And average managers play checkers, while great managers play chess. And so, when I do programs on employee manage or uh, management, when I ask the audience, "What's the difference between checkers and chess?" Always, the first response is, "Oh, in." Uh, Chess, it involves strategy. Well, checkers has strategy too, but obviously chess is way more complex strategy. But then I, I ask, okay, but what makes the strategy behind chess so much more complicated? And eventually people get to the point of there are different, different pieces in chess that have different rules of engagement, that have different moves. And so the typical manager has their own particular style of giving feedback, of of giving praise, of delegating, etc., and they use that on everybody. But world-class managers understand the unique needs and communication style preferences and drivers of engagement, etc., of each employee and know how to use that accordingly. And these conversations help you get to that information. So one of the ways of thinking about it is each employee has their own engagement recipe. And so the, the question is, how do you find out that recipe? So how do you customize the employee experience so it best fits? Now, I want to do a big picture context of, about why it's so critical for you to do this in today's world. And it's what I think of as the Starbuckification of society. So did you think about, especially the younger generation of workers, they're used to ha having customized uh, I hate to use the word, that buzzword, solutions, but customized products and services. So whether it's their latte or being able to buy the one song from the album that they like versus when many of us were growing up, you had to buy the whole album uh, and suffer through the, the lousy songs to get the one song you like. Also, world class organizations that are known for giving world-class customer service have learned to customize the experience find out what, what guests want, particular guests want, track those wants and needs so they can deliver them when they come to their hotel, for instance, like Ritz-Carlton is great at that. It also, the importance, speaks to one of the six critical global megatrends identified by the Hay Group. And this is really fascinating. And so here's one of the global trends is to cuss as individualization and so one of their takeaways is companies must understand every worker and customer as an individual or lose out on talent and business. Engagement will need to be more personal, tapping into each employee's needs, drivers, and expectations. And so because in the, the retail world, the customer world, people are used to having 
an individualized experience, we need to duplicate that in the work world. But, you know, here's the thing. It's not about, I, I can imagine some people thinking, oh, man, you know, we're adult being indulgent. We're, you know, feeding into the entitlement mentality, et cetera. It's, it's, not, it's not that at all. It's just being smart about knowing what levers to turn to get the best performance out of people and the ingredients to have an employee experience. So you are the employer of choice for the, the A-list, what I call A-list talent. So what are the core ingredients of the uh, the recipe, if you will? And so here's here's what what I'm thinking about in terms of using the recipe analogy. So let's say you want to bake some type of bread. Well, there are core ingredients. There's going to be some kind of flour, some kind of oil, uh, salt, and then various other types of ingredients. And different variations of those ingredients will make different types of bread. So what I'm going to share right now are the essential ingredients based on the work that I've done over the years in, in studying research on human nature and then translating that into the workplace, translating that into the drivers of motivation, the drivers of a fulfilling, inspiring work experience. So each employee has their own unique type of need for meaning and purpose. But overall, human beings have a hunger for meaning and purpose. We want to feel like our lives matter. We want to feel like our work matters. And so one of the the things that you want to find out from each employee is what makes me work meaningful to them. What, how can their work fit into their own personal life mission and purpose? And so human beings have the desire to feel like I am part of something that makes a difference in the world, and I personally make a difference. So it's not enough just to feel like I'm part of an organization that does good things. There also needs to be the feeling that my particular work is contributing to this big picture. So that's part of the conversation needs to be about, are you feeling these, you know, are you feeling it? <laughs> are you feeling these uh, connections? And if not, let's work together to make sure that you are feeling those. Another fundamental human need is MAP, Mastery Achievement Progress. Those of you who've listened to or, t you know, attended other webinars or or conference presentations of mine have heard me share about Dr. Teresa Amabile's work on, she calls the progress principle. And with knowledge workers, the feeling that I'm making progress at, at my work was discovered to be the number one motivator. And human beings, if you, if you have children, especially if they're still young, say three and under, you could just see how intrinsically mo motivating it is to learn and master something. So you don't have to bribe your little, you know, child to learn how to walk or or tie their shoes that just learning how to solve those problems and and master those situations are intrinsically rewarding they the it's hardwired into the nervous system to want to uh, accomplish that and so anything and everything that enables employees to experience mastery and along the way progress is uh, um, intrinsically motivating leads to engagement. The need for autonomy. Research by Blessing White showed that having autonomy was the number one driver of discretionary effort. So in other words, discretionary effort, any amount of effort employees engage in above and beyond the minimum to keep their job. Also, human beings, we're creatures of belonging. We're creatures of community, creatures of relationship. And so finding out if you're each, you know, each direct report, if they feel a sense of belonging or they just feel like an outsider in your organization. And just to FYI, with your millennials, that is a huge factor with your new hires and millennials, whether they feel welcomed and integrated into your organization. Also related to relationships, if you've heard me speak on resilience and how to create a resilient workforce, you've undoubtedly heard and hopefully remembered that I talk about the important role that relationships play, strong relationships play, and whether you have a resilient workforce. Also, core ingredient is problem solving, learning, and professional development. So over and above what I just mentioned, so having the opportunity to say, uh, to be actively involved in problem solving and the learning that comes from that, 
Research, especially on millennials, shows that they are a place incredibly high value on opportunities for professional development. And so if you're not providing that, you're going to be losing your talented uh, millennials. By the way, speaking of that, I know most of the people on this webinar are not from Maine, where I am, or New Hampshire. But those of you who are, just a quick shout out, I'm actually doing a day-long seminar on November 9th, all about managing millennials. And so if you um, haven't seen the announcement about that, um, I encourage you to uh, check uh, the uh, latest last two e-scenes because there's a link to that. We, we're going to talk all about how to actually deliver on these these key needs of millennials. Also, employees want, you know, we all want personal professional respect. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means something different to different people. And so part of the help me, help you, help us conversation is finding out what equals feeling respected for each employee. And actually, let me just back up for a second with a professional development. Obviously, different employees have different professional development needs. And you know what? It's making me think about one of the uh, bits of feedback that I got from the team that I supervised back when I was working in corporate America. I supervised a um, a uh, learning and development team for a call center for an insurance company. So we did all the customer service development for the call, uh, the call center reps. And one of the things that they said they appreciated the most about me compared to previous managers is that I asked them about their professional development interests. I, did, I didn't just see them as a little worker bee whose only value was to deliver seminars and other types of training. I cared about their professional development and looked for opportunities, not just to send them to seminars. I mean, that's the easy thing. But look for opportunities within the company to involve them in situations and projects where they got to develop those skills. So, for instance, if somebody wanted to have uh, more skill coaching, where I might do a coaching uh, engagement, I would have them do it, or we would like co-present for senior leadership, etc. So, uh, we talked about respect to be seen and treated as an individual. And this is a huge, huge issue I see in today's workplace, and it's one of the core factors if you want to have a more engaged workforce, especially with your millennials. You think about how the millennial generation especially has been given so much attention growing up. It was interesting. I was talking with a, a fellow baby boomer, and she said it. She said this in just a perfect way, and so if you're – if you're um, a millennial, then this might be kind of eye-opening. She said, you know, it's so funny because when we were growing up, we were considered to be the side dish, whereas in today's world, in today's family, the kids are the main dish. And it was a really uh, perfect way of describing it. And I think that's something that causes, I know, that's something that causes friction between boomer managers and leaders and millennials is uh, they grew up in very different cultures. And so if your millennial employee especially doesn't feel like you see them and think of them as a unique human being, you will be losing them. So um, obviously you can't get that individual. You, uh, you have your own unique way of being and your, your own unique needs. You can't get that from employee survey. It has to come from one-to-one -one conversations. So, okay, so it's really important to do this, and these are some of the ingredients. Well, how do you tailor the experience? How do you customize it? Well, obviously, you have Help Me Help You Help Us Conversations, which this uh, webinar is about. And I also, I want to say it's not just Help Me Help You Help Us, although that's hugely important because the whole idea of having an employee is for them to provide value to the organization, and the whole idea of a manager is to help that employee provide the most value while having a, a wonderful time as possible at work. And obviously, if they're having a wonderful time at work, they're going to provide way better value than if they're disengaged or resentful. But it's also, it isn't just about hey, how can you help us? It's also help me help you have a great work experience. Help me help you understand how to bring out the best in you. Help me help you feel passionate about coming to work. 
And so how do you do that is you, in part, you learn to ask better questions. And I will uh, be sharing with you actually two uh, pages that have resources that build on this webinar. And one page has this article that I wrote back in May, How Managers Can Get Better Results by Asking Better Questions. And one of the things I've noticed in working with managers and leaders over the years is most have huge opportunity for improving their question asking ability. That if you think of your own experience as an employee, that most, most managers and most people in general are way more tuned into giving advice and being the answer guy or the answer gal versus asking great questions that draw out the learning and draw out the wisdom from the other person. And the better you are asking those questions, the better you are at growing your employees, and you're also able to find out what their unique recipe is recipe for satisfaction, for motivation, for performing at their best. So they don't just enable you to get the most productivity from each employee and boost engagement. They also, having these conversations, prevent unwanted turnover. And I imagine some of you have read this article, How One Company Lost an A Player and What You Can Do to Avoid It. Uh, in this, in the, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you read it, and I highly recommend that you share it with your managers. It's a really disturbing cautionary tale based on an interview I did with this really talented A-list player um, that any organization would want as an employee and the missteps along the way that um, this person's employer made that ended up making her go from thrilled to work there to leaving. So from an uh, excerpt from the, from the uh, article, when Courtney told her manager she was leaving, every senior leader she, she had worked with in the company pulled her into their office asking what it would take to change her mind. One even said she could write her own ticket and he would make it happen. The only ticket Courtney wanted, though, was her ticket out. And so you see that website, humannaturework.com backslash SHRM16. So the SHRM, that was the SHRM conference that the uh, presentation was at the Society for HR Management. Okay. So, so what are some of the questions you ask? Oh, okay, that's right. Here, here's audience participation. So here's what I want to ask you to do. So when I did this live, I had people break up into, I think, partners. What questions do you ask your direct port? So please type in some uh, some of your answers to this in the questions box. What questions do you ask or would you love it if your manager asked you? Like, man, it would be so great if my boss asked me that. So I'll give you an example or two uh, while I'm stalling for time to, to uh, see what questions you put in. So an obvious question would be, you know, can you describe how you like to get feedback? And just like when you interview, ask for examples. So can you give me an example of when previous manager you had gave you feedback in a way that was really helpful? And can you give me an example of when it just like flat out wasn't helpful? So that would be an example of a question. All right, come on, folks. Let's see some questions in here. This is your big chance. All right, there we go for audience participation. Okay, so let's, uh, let's um, see what we've got here. The, um, okay, my boss is concerned only about projects and status. If I had a development question, I'd bring it up and get to get ideas from him, but there is no feedback. Man, bummer. I won't say what your name is. So sorry about that. Okay. Oh, that was, that was the one thing. Sorry. Yeah, and think about the difference, what this person just shared, the difference it would make in terms of their level of passion coming to work and their commitment to give 110%. One of the mantras, okay, here's another one coming up. One of the mantras that I share related to employee engagement and, and under the title of why your employees are just not that into you, I know some of you have either seen the webinar or heard the conference presentation, is one of the reasons why employees might not be into you is because they don't think you're into them. And so when managers just have what I call a user's mentality, when it's just here's what I need from you. Your only value is how you contribute to my goals and our company's goals. Then, then you're not going to feel bonded to them. You're not going to be 
concerned about what interests them because they don't care about you versus if they ask, you know, how can I help you, um, what's going on, etc. Okay, so Kelly, how can I help you reach your targets and goals? Yay, Kelly, and yay, Kelly, supervisor. How can I help you reach your targets and goals? Just think, and I bet the majority of you on this call have never had a manager ask that, or ra or maybe rarely. And oh, by the way, uh, do you see where I uploaded the handouts? This is some. This is a new feature. At least um, I haven't noticed it before. So I've uploaded the handouts, and I know I should know by now. I keep forgetting to mention um, in the beginning that I'll be handing out the handouts. So, uh, oops, sorry about that. Okay, so there's the handouts there. Um, so you're to know. Okay, uh, something here. Um, my employer has a rinky-dink reward program for good work, such as padded notebooks. Time off is so much more valuable. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, padded notebooks, not going to do it for me either. And you know what? I, I, thank you for sharing that. It reminds me of one of the stories I tell was from years ago where I was – this is back in the day before engagement was – a buzzword, and I was doing a program on keeping morale high, and one of the messages that I've been trying to deliver for the last 20 years is that you don't get high morale, and you could just substitute engagement, from goodies, gimmicks, and gala events. So bribing them with goodies, doing some kind of gimmicky flavor of the month, oh, I saw it on YouTube, so we're going to do it, or I heard it at a conference. And this, when I first started doing this, this is back in the day when, when Who Moved My Cheese was the thing and um, uh, the fish program, et cetera. And uh, one of the, um, or having like a gala event, like having Employee Appreciation Day when leaders serve hot dogs and burgers to employees, and it's like employees are supposed to, that's supposed to offset the daily uh, negative work experience and feeling of disrespect that they have. So, um, um, <laughs> okay, we've got a who moved my cheese, who moved my cheese fan. Okay, um, so one of the things that um, uh, somebody in the audience said was how their boss said, "Do you think morale's kind of low right now?" And she said, "Yeah, it really is." The lady was in HR. He goes, "Okay, how about if let's get everybody." a company logo hat, and this HR lady uh, had a good relationship with a business owner, and she's, uh, fortunately, because she said very sarcastically, yeah, that always, always does it for me when I'm feeling down and, and uh, you know, not having great morale, is having a logo hat, and he goes, that's probably not the answer, is it? She goes, no. He goes, well, get it anyway, and that's unfortunately the common mentality in, you know, when we live in a magic bullet, quick fix culture, is doing silly little gimmicky things, thinking that's the answer. Um, somebody said, I just went to Disney. Their customer service goes above and beyond. They must have some great employee recognition, too. Does anyone know their employee process? You can buy a book about their customer service. But what about employees? These folks are pretty engaged and happy to serve. They certainly are. I think there actually is a, a book specifically about – oh, Sharon. Hey, Sharon. Good to see you on the, the webinar. I think there is a book about what they do. Um, with employees at Disney. I, I off the top of my head I don't, but I, I think I've got it. So let's let's move on to some some questions. So here's some questions to ask. And again, you're you're you have the handouts right there and um, I've got articles and actually there's several articles about asking questions. So questions around goals, aspirations and interests that somebody had mentioned about a manager who did targets and goals, questions about strengths, and those of you who are, who are hip to the whole strengths-based approach to leadership, etc., people are, end up being infinitely more productive if you focus on their strengths and trying to rehab their weaknesses. Obviously, if they're uh, career-limiting weaknesses, they need to be addressed. But people are, you know, just think about it. We are happier, we're more alive, and we're more effective when we're doing things that um, that play off our strengths. Okay, what else? Questions around personality and behavioral styles. So if you don't know anything about the DISC profile or Myers-Briggs, I highly encourage managers. I use DISC, even though personally I like Myers-Briggs better. In terms of using it in the workplace, it's how practical and usable it is. Uh, I just find DISC being much more easily, easily implemented. So um, that's a really useful model to uh, for managers to understand how to modify their communication style, they're giving feedback, they're delegating, etc. 
questions like I, I gave an example of, questions around managers who brought out the best in you in the past, what did they do, managers, employers who made it difficult for you to be at your best. This is a great, these are two great com or questions to ask of new hires because A, they don't have any experience with you yet. If you ask them directly, what am I doing that brings out the best in you? What am I doing that drives you crazy? It's also, it's a safe way for both new hires and current employees to give you sort of disguised feedback. So let's say you tend to micromanage, but they're not about to say that to you because they're not so sure you really do want the straight truth. If you saw Jack Nicholson's character in A Few Good Men, they don't know if you can handle the truth. And so they might not tell you truthfully about things you need to improve on, but they will tell you about other managers that they've had. And that's sort of a, a disguised way that they can give you feedback. Asking them about their most important job ingredients. So, you know, what are some of the most important job ingredients for you that keep you excited about coming to work, et cetera? And there are actually specific online tools that help you ask, help your managers ask those questions in a very precise way. So, um, you know, and, and actually track what those issues are or those job ingredients so that the employee and the, employ and the supervisor can be meeting on an ongoing basis to track how are we doing, are these key job ingredients in place, etc. And so here are the um, Remember, you've got this in the handouts, the two uh, resource pages. So the, the bit.ly link, help me help you, that's, I've got the, um, I also have the slides there, and then I will also put the recording there. You'll also get a follow-up link that has a link to the recording. The humannaturework.com backslash Sherm 16, that's a, a mega page for people who attended one of the two conference presentations I did. And you, you can get the slides to those conference, con, um, conference presentations as well as a bunch of articles that go into more depth about having those types of help me help you conversations. Okay. And let's see. Okay. Questions about – oh, okay. So now the reason why I say okay is I have to move the, the panel so I can actually see what the slide is. So. Uh, questions about me as a manager, that's another more tricky genre of question, but an important genre. So it's trickier than saying, you know, tell me about managers that have brought out the best in you, et cetera. So what do I do that's most helpful? What do I do that's most frustrating? What's the one thing that if I started doing would, be, would make such a difference for you? Whoops, oh, okay, so uh, uh, we'll start off with stop. What's the one thing that if I stopped doing would make the biggest difference to you in terms of your quality of experience and my ability to bring out the best in you? And then what's the one thing that if I started doing would make the biggest difference? And what's something that I do, but it would be so good if I do more of? So let's say, for example, like this, they might say, you know, I really appreciate when you point out with specifics when I do something really well, and I would love it if you did more of that. And as I bet you know, that's one of the most important things with your millennials, is giving much more regular ongoing feedback, including catching them doing something right, doing things right. Questions about managerial moments of truth. So asking them questions about delegation and expectations. So the way I'm, I'm, you know, so one of the areas, so let's say I'm, I'm being you, the manager. So one of the areas I'd really uh, like your feedback on is the way that I delegate tasks and projects. Uh, am I clear? Do I give you enough room to apply your own expertise or do I get to like in the weeds saying this is how I want to do, you know, want you to do it? Um, what about, and then like another conversation or another aspect of the conversation, what about expectations? How clear do I make it about this is what I'm looking for? This is what excellence looks for. Do sometimes you feel like you're flying blind or like I'm not getting it? And what can is there anything I can do to make it more comfortable for you to ask me questions if I'm not being clear either in delegation or my expectations? I alluded to this before. Ask about feedback. Like, 
can you give me can you give me feedback on my feedback? Do I give it enough? What would be your ideal if you were to say in the best of all possible worlds, this is how I would love to be getting feedback and how often uh, can you give me some ideas or um, are there examples that you can think of that I gave feedback that you're like, man, I really appreciated the way you did that or examples where it's like eh, not so much it was um, wasn't helpful. How do you like appreciation recognition? This is obviously a huge one, A, because employees in most workplaces don't get nearly enough appreciation and recognition. And number two, as you know, but I just want to emphasize that everybody has their own unique recipe of forms of appreciation recognition that work for them and those that don't. But also, actually, let me just stop for a second. At the meta level, M-E-T-A, so at a higher level, looking down at this conversation from like a conceptual point of view, one of the things that I think about, and some of you have heard me talk about everything matters. When it comes to dealing with employees, everything matters. Every interaction has an impact, whether better or worse. And also, every conversation, every interaction communicates something to employees about what you think about them and how you feel about them. When I say how you feel about them, whether you value them, whether you care about them as individuals. Okay. So at the meta level, look at this. Asking these questions about best ways to delegate, express expectations, give you feedback, show your appreciation and recognition, think about what that communicates to the employee about how sincere you are in wanting to be the best possible manager for them as possible, how serious you are and sincere you are about their well-being and how you do see them and value them as an individual. And so just the act of asking these questions and engaging in these help me help you, forget to help us for a second, help me help you conversations, help me be the best possible manager for you, because that's my job. And that's actually what I said when I first um, was uh, hired to supervise this team. I said, you know, obviously my responsibility is to bring out the best in you. I mean, I want to do that, and also that's my job. And if I'm not doing that, I'm doing a lousy job. And so I really want and appreciate and need your input and feedback if I'm doing things that get in the way of that, if I'm doing things that bug you, that make it hard for you to do your job, etc. So asking questions about um, critical managerial moment of truth related to resolving conflict. And you think about, I bet you've never had a manager ask you for feedback on what are some things that we can do together if we do have some sort of tension or, or kind of prickly topic, topic going on. What can we do together that would um, help us resolve that? Okay, so for this, for this to work, Feedback requests and interviewing skills managers need to have, and that's, that's as you know, that is a significant skill set that many people, if not most people, don't have. There need, and as part of that, there needs to be a level of emotional safety, which in many organizations is not, is not present. And so that's where doing the hard work of training managers, coaching managers, speaking to all employees about the critical role of emotional safety, sometimes called psychological safety, if the important role that plays if you want to get honest feedback that can improve your, your organization's ability to attract, retain, and engage talent and the emotional safety required to need, that needs to be in place if you're going to get honest feedback on how you can tailor the, um, uh, uh, the employee experience. It obviously needs to be follow through. If if you gather all this information, nothing happens with it, nothing nothing good is going to happen. In fact, it'll have the reverse effect. It'll make things even worse, again, as you know. But I, I wanted to put that up there as a reminder because still, even though it's common sense, I would say the majority of organizations do really bad follow through. And it also needs to be an ongoing conversation. Now, I just want to say one big picture piece about the um, uh, getting the information. At the meta level, um, this understanding what works best for each employee 
at the bigger picture level, this relates to the global organization in the sense of one of the major points that in the why your employee engagement survey is not cutting it, we need to customize the employee experience. One of the major takeaways besides that you need to find out each employee's individual engagement recipe is this. There's no way you're going to find out the things that your organization is doing that is preventing you from getting the best out of your people, preventing you from having stellar engagement levels. There's no way you're going to get that from a survey. You only get the depth and richness of information from individual interviews. And having been in this field for uh, quite a long time now, from my own experience, you won't get the full-on honesty and richness of information that you need if you only do in, um, in-house interviews. And, and I say that from experience where, where I've done interviews, I've gone in with organizations, done interviews with employees, even in organizations that have good cultures and great HR people. There's things that they'll tell an outsider that they won't tell an insider. And so I really, and I feel weird saying this because it, it sounds like, you know, it's self-promoting, um, but it's it's just the truth. It's just as simple as that. So if, if you are serious about really digging into how to be a world-class employer at the meta level, I mean, at the bigger, you know, at the bigger picture level, you really, I, you're wise to consider, you know, using your, your favorite consultant to um, get that information because they'll get information that, um, that you're not able to internally. So next step, share this with your colleagues because you don't want to be the only one asking great questions and tailoring the employee experience. You want your whole organization to do that. You can share the articles at that uh, URL. And there also includes both my 2012 version of the article, Why Your Employees Are Just Not That Into You, and then the 2016 version, which looks at it from a very relational piece as opposed to the first version of it was more looking at a bunch of different factors that lead employees to not be that into the employer. Explore the technological component to make it more precise and trackable. If you want, you can reach out to me about what are some of the um, platforms available, or you can just Google it. And then pilot or with a whole group, training and, de and deployment. I recommend piloting. And so picking your best managers and doing a training on how to ask good questions, how to create emotional safety, et cetera, and then engage them in, uh, uh, in the conversation. So <laughs> I can't remember why I put the pot of gold uh, in the slide, but I left it because it's it's colorful. It looks happy. Um, so I, I think I don't know. I think that was the end of the seminar. Okay. So um, again, there's the the link. And if you have questions, I mean, you've got you've got my email because you've heard from me. Any close? Look at that. We ended four minutes early. How cool is that? There's all my contact info. If you uh, want to learn about getting training for your people internally about how to have these conversations, about um, engaging millennials or all generations, uh, obviously reach out. Any closing questions, I'll wait 30 seconds. And uh, if you don't and you just want to sign up, hey, thanks for uh, being part of this. You'll Again, you'll get the recording and encourage you to share the recording with your tribe. And also, if there's uh, any feedback you have about other topics to cover or anything you want to say about this. So, looking, any questions going once, going twice. Okay, we are, whoops, oops, 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 what's this? Oh, hey, thanks, Sharon. Fabulous as always. Love the handout and resources. Thanks, Sharon. I really appreciate that. And I will check out, see if I can find that book uh, for you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Okay, so thanks, gang. I uh, hope to see you in the future, and I will shoot you out the info on the um, how to bring out the best in millennials. So take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye.